How about the maze? <laughs> you know what? It's an easy game. It's a simple game. You catch the ball, you throw the ball. And, uh, but some two teams do it better than others, right? And the A's are doing it better than others because of one thing. There's no quit in them. Most of their, most of their wins, I've been watching them all summer on the DVR, you know. And uh, it's like, I like to fast forward because I could fast forward up to the time where they actually start hitting. It's so usually around the seventh inning, then the comeback starts, and then I don't know how many uh, extra inning games they've had this summer, but there's no quit in them, and I like that. And we're going to talk about not quitting today. John Eldridge writes in his book, Fathered by God, about the various stages of masculine development, and I think this short paragraph here speaks to our understanding of the process we must engage to establish a life of prayer. Listen, quote, We don't know much about the stages of development in our instant culture. We have someone else who makes our coffee for us. We no longer have to wait to have our photos developed, not even an hour. For now, we have digital cameras that deliver back to us the image instantly. We don't have to wait to get in touch with someone. We can email them, call them. He put on here, page them. I thought that was hilarious because we no longer do that. We can call them on a cell phone, instant message them any moment. Don't be reaching out to anybody right now. We don't need to wait for our leather jackets or our jeans or caps to age to get that rugged look. They come that way now. They're pre, pre-faded and pre-tattered, right? Character can be bought and worn immediately, end quote. Character can be bought and worn immediately. I teach students, some students, who are really only interested in the grade. They just want the grade. And um, they, want to, they want to know all the shortcuts to the high GPA. They really don't ask questions because they want to learn. They ask questions to find a way to kind of cheat the process of development. Whatever happened to learning? and growing, whatever happened to developing and becoming, right? Whatever happened to real character that was developed over a lifetime, the kind of character that stands up when others sit down, the kind of character that continues when everyone else quits. Prayer can be like that. We know we need to pray. We know we need to pray more. We think about When we used to pray more, how strong we felt in the faith and how we had our few knocks along the way and we've missed a few days and then a few more days and then a lot of days and suddenly we don't really remember how to pray. We think, I wish I never stopped. I wish I never stopped. Jesus spoke specifically to his disciples about this very issue. If you take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 18, I'm not sure if it showed up on our notes uh, because sometimes I add stuff late, so you better have your Bible ready and your pen ready to go because I'm always editing at the last minute. And uh, Jesus said to his disciples, he told his disciples a parable. It says in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He told them a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I like that phrase, that they should always pray and not give up. And so now here's the why you need to do that. And he said, a certain, there was a certain, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him for the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God and care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she will eventually come and attack me. And Jesus said, listen to what the unjust says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, 
he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He's talking about this phrase that he uses earlier, that we would not give up. It's actually translated in some um, uh, text as faint. Do not faint. Do not faint. In other texts, it would say lose heart. Do not lose heart. It comes from a Greek word. It's only used about six times in the New Testament. Inkakia in is the Greek word, okay? And, and, it, and it has different forms, but it has a very specific meaning about losing heart. And the first part of that word kind of talks about how that this comes from inside out. This comes from inside out. This is where, this is where it starts. This is where the battle is. And when we lose heart, when we lose heart, we've already lost any battle we're going to face. If we go into the battle without completely committed to the battle, we're going to lose our way. And then Paul uses it in Ephesians chapter 3. And while he's talking to these, these are young believers in Ephesus. They're young Gentile believers. And they're struggling with their part in the kingdom of God. They're struggling with the concept of being grafted in to God's great family. And he's talking to them. And one of the things he's saying to them is don't get discouraged. Yes, I'm in prison. Yes, it's difficult. Don't get discouraged about that. And don't lose heart about any coming persecution that you will face. He's telling them, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't quit. And he says, and here's why, he says, and then he turns in a few verses later in verse 16 of chapter 3, and he begins a prayer. He starts praying for them that they would be uh, strengthened. And he reads it, I'll read it here to you, verse 16, that we be strengthened with might through the spirit where in the inner man. He knows where the work has to be done, that here in our heart, we have to be strengthened with the knowledge that God is for us that God is ours, that we can trust him, and that he's with us always. When that happens, when we're there, then we can go out and face whatever battle we want to face. So here's my question. How do we pray when we feel like giving up? And I thought about taking time to explain how many times I wanted to give up. But I think you already have those stories in your own mind, right? And so I just want you to tap into those. I don't need to communicate those to you because you already have those. We all have these moments where we want to give up. How do you pray when you feel like giving up? When you're in the presence of God in a beautiful worship service like this morning, man, it's hard not to pray. You just, you just want to engage God. It's awesome. But sometimes you're in the battle, you're in a difficult situation, and you can lose heart. You can pray a long time for something and finally just say, that's it. I'm done praying about this. How do we not lose heart and remain steadfast in a posture of prayer, seeking his hand to move in our situation? I have three things to give you today. Number one, you preserve in prayer when you make it a habit. You preserve in prayer when you've made it a habit. Now, Paul instructs his church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And this verse here rivals Jesus wept as the shortest uh, verse in the Bible. All right? Listen from verse 16. Rejoice always, verse 17. Pray continually, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Pray continually because this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Pray continually. I don't have time to pray all the time. I got to go to work. I'm raising a family. Hey, Paul. The days of living in a monastery are past for me. I got to live here in the real world. Listen, I get that. I get that we are busy. And I know that one of the challenges that we face is how do I block out time in my life to have an habitual connection with God? How do I do that? That becomes a struggle for us. Pastor Lance did a tremendous job last week talking to us about how to pray to God. What we're talking about today is how do I keep praying to God when I've kind of lost heart here? It's really about establishing a habit. It's not about entering into prayer. It's about the process of, of engaging that. And it takes time and effort to get that done. But it is a worthy endeavor. See... When it comes to prayer, there are no shortcuts. Turn to your friend and say, there are no shortcuts in prayer. Try that. And make sure their eyes are open. Just check. It's bright up here. I can't tell if you're sleeping. So this is why I check on you. Okay. It's still a process. It takes time and patience to develop the character to pray continually long after the novelty has worn thin. 
after we have prayed and prayed and suddenly we just want to give up? How do we linger when we just want to quit? How do we hang on when, the wonder, when we wonder if anyone is really listening? You know, sometimes our prayers, they don't even have enough uh, power to get to the ceiling, let alone through the ceiling to the throne of God. We just feel powerless at times. But we have to develop a habit of prayer, and that is a process. Listen to the wisdom of James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I put that in the New King James Version because that's how I memorized it. I want you to look at NIV. It says, let perseverance... Finish its work. Let perseverance finish its work. And then in the English translation, it says, let endurance have its perfect effect. And then the amplified really gets busy and says, and let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work. What shouts to me from this passage is the idea of process. We are all in process. Our lives are in process and there are just some things that take time. And it's really unavoidable. And so the admonishment is to not grow weary or to give up, to lose heart, to quit too soon, setting aside our faith. Instead, the implied meaning here is to learn to wait patiently on the Lord and to establish a habit of going to God in prayer. Establish a habit to going to God in prayer. I'm back in the gym now. I know you can't notice. but um, And it was difficult for that first appearance in the gym to actually work out. Now, I went to the gym and I signed up. But it was about weeks before (laughs) I actually used that little, little card and checked myself in and started working. It's difficult when you make that first appearance to stand there and look at all those torture machines and think, I paid for this opportunity. (laughs) I remember how well each piece of equipment works. I'm familiar with the exercises that you're supposed to use with the free weights. I don't look like an idiot. I don't get on them backwards. I get on them correctly. I know how to fast. I know how fast the treadmill has to move to get my heart rate where it needs to be to make a difference in building up my endurance. And I know how long it's going to take to get back to where I once was. You know, it takes a, it's a long mountain climb, but it is a slippery slope on the other side when you quit. You walk away like Arnold, and the next minute, you're like Danny DeVito. Boom, just like, (laughs) boom. You lose it all. I know how sore I'm going to be the following day after I've been pushing all these weights around for an hour. And there's a voice screaming in my ear, run, Forrest, run. Leave while you can still walk. And then I look down at the workout shirt that used to fit me, and I realize that it's been way too long. Time to get back on the horse. Time to not be as big as a horse. Okay. Then I look around the room, and I see Captain America's brother lifting weights over in the corner, (laughs) lifting barbells bigger than me, right? (laughs) I think I can do that. I think I can't do that. It hurts me to watch. And it's a bit humbling to stand at the low end of the weight rack and start all over again. But start again, I must. And I think how awesome it would be or how awesome I would be if I had never stopped because I started several years ago. And I was getting, whew. And I lost my commitment along the way. If I'd have stayed with it, I would look like Captain America. Hashtag twinning. (laughs) So I get busy. I start running. I start pushing weight around like an old pro, mostly old and pro. And I feel the swell of the muscles. And I think, I got this. I am Captain America. And then I glance at the mirror on the wall, that giant mirror. I hate that thing. And it reminds me that I'm still me. I wish then I could find a shortcut. I wish I could find a shortcut. But muscles aren't built overnight. Weight isn't lost in a day. It's going to require endurance, and I'm going to have to keep coming back again and again and again. This is what James is saying about patience. 
It has to have its perfect work in us. It has to accomplish what it came to do for us. I was moving tables around my room and my class getting set up. And one of the students was there early and he was helping me. And when we got done, I was breathing kind of heavy. And he, he said to me, Mr. C, you all right? I go, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, you're breathing kind of heavy. He's kind of getting worried he's going to have to call 911 or something. And I said, no, no, I'm good. Now, I noticed this week on the treadmill as I was puffing it out, man, that I had to actually increase the resistance. I had to tilt that baby up. And I had to crank up the speed to get my heart rate to that optimal level because I had already beat those other levels. I'm starting to make progress. Dun, 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 right? I'm stronger. I'm moving up the weight rack also. I'm starting to feel like a part of the team. Not the little skinny kid in the corner. And my workout shirt fits. That's the best news. It's a process. And if I'm going to preserve in prayer, I've got to understand that that is a prayer, that is a process also. And I need to come again and again to pray. Listen to the words of instruction that comes to us from Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Jesus taught us here, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Now verse 8, if you read along in your Bible, says, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what, is a man, or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father in heaven give good, gives good gifts to those who ask him? We can see the results of not praying, of not asking, of not seeking, of not knocking. Nothing. Nothing happens when we have not asked. Nothing happens when we've not sought him. Nothing happens when we have not bothered him with our incessant knocking. This is all about engaging God in relationship. And that is all centered on our conversations with God. And that's why we're talking about it. That's what this series is about. Habit can be a good thing. Habit can be a bad thing. And when we skip something, we know it. We immediately feel the effects. Tomorrow morning, if you forget to brush, brush your teeth and you head out into traffic and you're driving along, you're going to be, oh, no. You're going to talk to people like this all day long because you immediately know that habitual thing you always do, you have missed it. We need to get that point about prayer. We have to form a, a habitual practice of spending time with the Father in prayer just as we see demonstrated in the life of Jesus Jesus himself walked among us, and he demonstrated it. The Bible says he often withdrew from his disciples to pray. He even left the boys struggling on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the storm to stay in communion with the Father, and no doubt to help them learn how to pray more. And if prayer was essential to Jesus, it should be essential to each one of us all the time. That's a good place for an amen right there. Do you recall when Jesus had his disciples accompany him to the garden the night before he was arrested? They went there to pray, and they weren't very good at it. They mostly slept. At this point in the process, they had not fully established the habit of prayer, and so their flesh was weak despite their desire. We can all relate to them, amen? It had not been established in their life as a habit. Listen, a habit is reflexive, it's automatic, it's knee-jerk reaction to our situation. If prayer has become a habit, we will knee-jerk toward him when we fall into various trials and temptation, or when trouble comes knocking, or when we face the enemy at the gate. We will do what we have always done, we will pray. So it must be learned in a way that forms in us a natural response to what we face in this life. Thus, the work of patience will teach us. It will form us. It will transform us. It will complete us. It will equip us to pray continually and to never give up. Our early prayers in the faith are often answered really quickly. It's like he knew what we were thinking before we asked. 
And he kind of does. I think it says it in the scriptures that he knows what we need before we ask. But as we grow older in our faith, we must learn to grow. We've got to up the resistance. We've got to speed up the treadmill. We have to get stronger. We have to build up our endurance. And that means we have to hit the gym more regularly. We have to get to the point that if we miss it, we actually feel it. And it has, and then it has to move us toward entering into an ongoing conversation with the Father. Just in your own mind, think about it. When's the last time I had an hour alone with Jesus? I learned this in a very unique way while I was at Bethany Bible College. Some of you will recognize the name Mark Buntain. He was a Assembly God minister from Canada, eventually traveled to Calcutta, India in 1954, where he conducted outreach ministries, fell in love. God placed a burden on his heart. He fell in love with the, with the poor there in Calcutta, and he, is, he just left his whole life there. He's born there. He's, or excuse me. He's buried there because that's where his heart was. He and Holda began, before his death in 1989, he and his wife Holda began... Um, feeding programs for the poor, building schools, powerful growing church, along with a hospital to meet the continuing needs of the needs of the poor. They have truly lived out the gospel in a tangible way. And after his death, Hold the Buntain continued. In fact, in 2014, she celebrated 60 years in Calcutta. And she continues to feed, educate, medically assist the poor in the city. Under her leadership, I got this right off the website. The projects have grown to include over 100 primary and secondary schools, Bible and vocational schools, children's home, a daily feeding program for 10,000 people, rural clinics, and 173-bed hospitals serving 100,000 patients each year and providing 40% with free care. These are amazing examples of what God can do to a sur- with a surrendered life. All right, Tim, what's that have to do with prayer? Well, he visited Bethany for a week of ministry to our student body. He preached at our chapels. We had evening services. People gathered for lengthy worship times and prayer times, and it was powerful. We were challenged with the call of God. We were inspired by what one man under God's hand can accomplish in the darkest places. But I learned the secret to his life, a habit. Not from his presentations, but from just observing him alone in a private moment. After an extended time of prayer, I was leaving chapel from the back door, and he was leaving from the front door. And we were both heading in the same direction, the coffee and the dining commons. And I sped up just to be able to greet him, shake his hand, say thank you. I'd been so ministered to. He was suddenly a new hero to me, and I wanted to get close. But as I got close, uh, as I, excuse me, as I closed in on his position, I took a deep breath, what I was going to speak that I had already rehearsed in my mind, because every time I meet famous people, I say something stupid, like, you're my greatest fan. You know, I do that stuff. <laughs> and so I had kind of rehearsed that. <laughs> and I got up close, I got ready to speak, and I froze. I froze because of what I heard or overheard. He was walking alone. No one was closer to him than me. In fact, there was no one else out there. But he was in a conversation. The kind of conversation I was unwilling to interrupt at that moment. I slowed my steps, but I kept my pace just far enough behind not to be creepy. And I listened. And I realized he was praying. Rather, he was talking to the Father And the way a man would talk to another man, a son to a father. It was deep. It was intimate. You felt the familiar comfortableness between him and the father. He even spoke with other tongues. It was kind of commingled in the conversation. And he was talking about us, the students. He was thanking God for his grace toward us, his work in us around those altars. It was like a post-event debrief among friends, deep, lifelong friends. I slowed up and I watched him go his way as another student was walking towards him and began to speak to him. He paused and politely answered her question, 
And then he continued his conversation. I said under my breath to no one in particular, I want that. I want that. And somewhere deep in my heart, I heard, okay, game on. And since that day, I have tried to form the habit of prayer by allowing my prayer to be more than just when I bow in church, over my food, not just when I'm at church, or when I'm asked to pray publicly. I began to have conversations with the one who had invited me into this deep friendship. And it's become a habit. It's a knee-jerk thing. I told my students yesterday in class that uh, as they were sharing prayer requests, we took time to do that. And I said, I want to, before we even start praying, I want you to know that we're already praying. We've already been talking to God. Even as I asked you to share your needs, we're already talking. Right now, we're praying, people. We're in a conversation with the Almighty. We've invited him. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. He's been here all along. He's been waiting for us. And he's already engaged in a conversation with us. That's the supernatural power of God. He comes to be with us in whatever moment we're in. And he wants to engage us at whatever level we're at. And even now, God's speaking to us. Okay? There's a conversation going on, and it's not just between me and you. It's between the Almighty. And I said that to the students. You know, I never did get to meet Mark Buntain, ever, never shook his hand. But his prayer life changed mine forever. He was doing something that came so easy and so natural, like a lifelong habit formed over years of steadfast and continuous prayer. He had followed Paul's admission, admonition from 1 Thessalonians. Pray continually. It's how we preserve in prayer in the most difficult times in our life. We preserve in prayer when we have made it a habit. That's why James could say, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptation. Because that patient time, is that going to be the time that you're going to wait patiently before the Lord? Beyond that, you preserve in prayer when you remember that there is nowhere else to turn. That there's no one else to turn. There are moments in our walk with Jesus that we can be overwhelmed with anger and confused with his silence or his lack of responses to our prayers. So that we ask the question, what's the point? I don't know if you've ever said that, but I've said that a few times to the Lord. What's the point? Why am I even talking to you about this if nothing's going to happen? We get there. We can even decide to take matters up into our own hands and to make things happen those things that God seems unconcerned about or unwilling to act upon. And sometimes we make it worse because we picked it up. God's not moving fast enough for me, so I'll do it myself. There are some times or some things that Jesus requires of his disciples that, are, that were just too hard for them to either grasp or to do. He was teaching to them one day, and he was telling them, my body, my flesh, you need to eat my flesh. You need to drink my blood. You need to have this part with me. And they all went, whoa, 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 whoa. That's far. I, I'm not doing that. There's no cannibals here. We're not doing that. And it was too hard for them to either grasp or to do, to surrender to it. And at this time, the Bible says that many began to depart. Many began to, to depart. In John chapter 6, verse 66 and following here. He said, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Sometimes following Jesus, doing the right thing can be difficult. Standing in prayer, continuing to trust in his love and his power can test our patience. Sometimes we might, want to th that, that we might think it's too hard, too difficult. Jesus, you ask too much of me. We just want to give up. I know that's true of you because you're no different than me. And there have been many times I've said, this is too much. Jesus turned to his 12 disciples, those men that have been following him, and he said these words to them. Do you want to leave too? Do you want to leave too? In verse 68 of that same passage, Peter says, the answer, he speaks for all of them. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. There it is. Where else can we turn? Well, we can find a doctor to heal us in some ways. We can find a surgeon that can repair something that's broken or torn. We can find a friend or a family member to give us some help in our time of need. But which of your friends have the word of e- words of eternal life? The reality is there are limitations to what man can do for us. And there are times when we come to the end of those resources and all we have is God. My youngest son, Taylor, uh, uh, FaceTimed us early this morning on top of a mountain in Virginia. And he was like, hey, look at the view. We're like, what in the world? What are you doing? And he was up hiking. And then little Judah was strapped to his back. And I think Judah was going, I don't know what we're doing. I have no control. I'm just being drug along. Uh, he, he lightened up our day. But when he was a little guy, little, they, were, they were both in elementary. Kim was out on a Saturday. I was home crashing and burning from my long week of work because I, I was trying to get some Sabbath going. And she had taken the boys and they'd gone shopping. They'd been out running around. And so they stopped by McDonald's to get a snack because you always got to get boys a snack either on your way or coming from that promise. If you'll behave, we're on our way to the golden arches. Dun, da, da, da. You know, that kind of thing has to happen. And so they'd already had their little snack, and they had pulled into the garage, and Kim was hauling stuff into the house, and I was ha- kind of helping her. And then the boys were out getting their rollerblades on, and they were rollerblading, and, and they were finishing off their sodas, right? And Taylor decided to pop the lid off of his and start sucking on the ice because it was hot, and he sweats, and he didn't want to be hot. So he's sucking on the ice, and then tragedy hit. He started choking on a big piece of ice. And he called out for Michael's help, and Michael started, he didn't know what to do, so he ran in. He found Mom in the laundry room. She ran right out. They were outside, and I can hear a commotion. And then suddenly I heard my wife's voice go, Tam! And I was like, whoa, that's emergency. That's 911. I got up, and I ran out there. They met me coming through the door, right, all three of them. We went to the bathroom. Went, What's going on? He's choking. And I realized he's choking on ice, and he's having the sensation, but he's not blue. I almost choked on a Dorito chip, and I actually turned blue. My older brother hadn't remembered something called the Heimlich. I would not be here today. He saved my life. And I looked at him, and I realized he doesn't need the Heimlich. He just needs to relax. So I start telling him, son, just relax. The, mel- the ice is melting. You still have the sensation, but you're not choking. You're no longer choking. And it was so funny. <laughs> His face just clouded up. And he looked around the room. He's looking at his older brother, you know. He's looking at his mom. He's looking at his father, right? And he goes, I just want God. It was as if to say, you people are no help. I'm dying here, and I need to go to a higher authority here because you people are limited in your ability to meet the need that I have currently. (laughs) There are weary moments. When even the gift of prayer does not seem like it's going to be enough for us. When someone says to you, I will pray for you, it just feels like a little pat on the head, like, good luck. When my mom and dad said to me over the phone, son, I'll be praying for you. I knew what that meant because I grew up in a house of prayer. My dad prayed scary. It was like he got otherworldly. And so mom prayed that way too. My younger brother, Ben, who was Down syndrome, he prayed that way. That was really scary. Down syndrome, praying in tongues. Of course, he always talked in tongues. We couldn't understand it. But the power of God would come into those little living rooms. When when they said to me, I'll pray for you, I knew it was going to happen. Some of us, we're so flippant with that. And everybody knows it. Right? It's just a passing comment. We're not really, we're going to think about them. We're going to feel bad for them. We may gossip about their situation, but we're not going to pray. There are moments we feel weary. We can get swallowed up in fear and panic and worry and strife and anger and hurt and bitterness. And our enemy is real and he really hates us. And we do, in fact, wrestle with principalities that we cannot see. Just ask Job whose wife got there first before Job did. And she said to him, just curse God and die. 
I love Job's response. It speaks to this point that we're talking about. Here's his response. It's really the climax of the story. He says, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. The implied point here is where else can I go? If I quit God, there's nowhere else. Ask David. He endured a long season of life before the promise of being king was fulfilled. And during that time, he was learning. He was growing. He was becoming strong. He was being equipped to hold his ground. And when you make it a habit and when you remember that there is no other one like him, we sang about it today, you can continue to pray, to believe, to hang on, even when it's by a thread of faith. Listen to his words, David's words in Psalm 42, verse 5. He repeats it in verse 11, and then he repeats it again in chapter 43, verse 5. It's actually one psalm that somehow they broke apart, but it is one psalm. And so Paul, or David is saying this three times in one song. Hear this echo from his soul. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. What's happening here? He's having memories. He's having memories, and it's changing his, certain, his circumstance right there. It's changing his view. It's changing his perspective. See, when you remember who he is, when you remember there is no one like him, when you remember there is no other place to run to, when you remember that he has the words of eternal life, then you can talk to yourself in the way that David did. You can say, soul, I know you're scared. I know you feel abandoned and forgotten, but you have not been forgotten. He is still your God. And from Psalm 42, verse 6 through 7, we read, My soul is downcast within me, he said. Therefore, I will remember. That's what David is saying. David's in exile away from the tabernacle of God at the time of writing this. Absalom has taken the throne, and he is in despair about that. And he's crying out to God. He's thirsting for the presence of God. The first verse says he's panting as a deer pants for the water brook. And he is remembering. And as he remembers, he begins to recognize the battle going on inside of him. It's a battle inside that that surfaces. Filled with depression and anxiety, he speaks to himself, put your hope in God. And an incredible insight occurs to him. He writes, deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. Prayer to the God of my life. He's saying, I'm going through a very difficult time, and I want to quit, and I'm depressed, and I'm overcome with anxiety, but I'm talking to myself You need to keep going back here. You need to pray. The memory of God evokes a new sense of awareness of his presence and his promise that he will be with him in the night and and it will be day again. Phillips Craig and Dean sings one of my favorite songs. There's a little bit of morning outside. It's a great word of promise that it may be dark right now, but tomorrow is coming. Even in his depression, he is praying, reaching back to God who is calling from the deep. You preserve in prayer when you've made it a habit. You preserve in prayer when you remember that there's nowhere else to turn. And finally, you preserve in prayer when you surrender to his help and you rest in his presence. You know, sometimes our situation, as I pointed out already, uh, <clears throat> gets to the point where we just can't even form the words to cry out to God. Have you ever been that way? Let's pray, and you just don't know how to start the words? Sometimes a situation comes to you, and it's so devastating, you don't even know how to begin to pray. You're feeling all the anger and the frustration and the fear, all of those waves of other things crashing over you, and it's hard to form those words. All you have is that eight-word prayer, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. That's it. That's all you got, because you can't, your, your brain is not functioning well. You can't think about the things that you need to ask for God. So how do we preserve in prayer when we cannot even begin to understand how to pray? Depression, fear, anger, confusion, and then, of course, fatigue and weariness can threaten in a a way that we might lose our heart. Now, it might sound like this morning so far that I'm suggesting that we just have to gut it out. I'm not. Really, I'm suggesting that our relationship in prayer should should deepen our fellowship with God in such a way that we know he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. We should have spent long enough time with him that, like Mark Montaigne, we just take every need to the Lord. 
We just have conversations. When this is really what faith is about. It's a settled assurance that he who that that he is who he says he is, and that we truly belong to him. And then he put the seal on it. He sent the comforter as the seal, as the promise. He's called the promise. He's called the paraclete, the one that comes alongside of us to help us. When our resources run dry, when they become ineffective, when we are completely deleted, uh, depleted. Listen to the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 7. He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Spirit himself intercedes for us in inexpressible groanings, wordless prayers. I like... uh, New King James Version rendering, he says, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's just this deep cry. The word is only used one other time in the New Testament. It's found in Acts chapter 7, verse 34. And it's in the middle of Stephen's powerful sermon about the Messiah. And in there, he's declaring who he is. And he gives this quote in verse 34. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. So as he's, as he's connecting to the old story of, of Moses, he's now talking, he's showing how Jesus is the new deliverer, right? And so in the same way that God heard those cries, he hears our groanings that are fostered by the work of the Holy Spirit in bringing about a rescue. It's a welling up of emotion, a release that is guttural, a cry from somewhere deep within the soul that just says, I want God. Lord, where are you? Lord, I need you. How I need you. And you know what? We get, we get hung up on tongues because we really miss the real purpose of them in our lives. It, it's not a symbol of salvation. Tongues are not a status symbol for elite believers. Tongues are not some demonic manifestation sent to confuse and confound. They're not. Tongues were never meant to replace the revealed word of God. They were meant to be a resource to every believer. And here we see how significant they can be When our native language fails us, we cannot find the words to adequately express our heart in prayer. We cannot even clear the cloud of confusion in our minds to form words that make any kind of sense. Sometimes there are no words this side of heaven that will work. Sometimes we need supernatural help to allow the deep to call to the deep. It just comes out as groans, as cries. See, prayer is a supernatural encounter with God, with the God of heaven. And why should we not be surprised when it requires something otherworldly to assist us in our prayer? Kim will tell you that many times that we have knelt in our living room to pray for our own burdens for our family. I have begun those prayer times with something to the effect of God, help us pray. We don't know what to do. We don't even know <coughs> how, we're to, how we're to ask Or what it is that we need. Because we don't know what we need. Please help us in our weakness. Essentially we are asking. Can you make sense of the cries of our heart? If we just cry out before you. If that's all we can do. Can you make sense of it? And the something happens as we pray. As we worship in spirit and in truth. As we by faith exercise the gift of tongues in prayer. Clarity comes to our mind and hearts. We start seeing what we are facing. We see what the enemy is trying to do. And we begin to know just how to pray. And then we let her rip. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Paul writes these words. What should I do? I will pray in my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing praises in my, with my spirit, but I will also sing praises with my mind. There's a pattern here to consider. 
My dad used to, and I, I used to have conversation about it. Notice the order. The order that brings a deeper understanding of the purpose of tongues in our prayer life. As I surrender to the work through me, okay, I begin to see and hear more clearly and can now actively participate in the prayer. Like having a spotter at the gym. Sometimes we just need the Holy Spirit to do the heavy lifting. See, our problem with tongues is not really doctrinal. It's really just about surrender. Listen, speaking in tongues is no more crazy than building an ark during the des- in a drought. It's no more ludicrous than marching around the, the city of Jericho shouting with little sticks in your hand. It's not ludicrous that way, right? Listen, the resurrection, you, you accept, or I should say, I accept the death and resurrection by faith. I receive the communion elements by faith and apply that truth to my heart. I cling to the promise of eternal life by faith. I give the tithe of the Lord by faith. How is this any different? How is this any different? It is clearly in the scripture that I hold close and that I love. Paul taught it. Even Jude said in his letter that a believer is built up as he prays in the spirit. Paul tells us in Ephesians, pray always in the spirit. It was the experience of the the apostles at Pentecost and beyond. It was the experience of first century church fathers. What keeps us from accessing or accessing the heavenly resource to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves? It's usually pride. It's usually pride. That's why I specifically use the word surrender in this point. Because that's what it comes to. See, listen. As long as you've got your hands in it, God can't get it done. You ever ask someone to help you on the computer? I can't figure out what's going on. And they're reaching to try to get that mouse out of your hand. And you won't let go. See, I do this and that happens and this doesn't work. And they're like, give me the mouse. (laughs) Give up the mouse. Surrender the mouse. And sometimes in our struggle with life, we got a hold of everything. We're doing it all. We want to do it. And God is saying, surrender. There has to be a point where we run out of gas, where we realize that we don't have the resources. And we've got to just stop moving and say, oh, God, I surrender. I surrender. You got it all. You're just no one like you. You're with me, and I know that. And so I'm going to trust you in this moment. And the Holy Spirit then comes alongside to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's a part of our warfare. Finally, my grandfather used to suggest that we needed to pray through. I used to think, what are we praying through exactly? Where are we going? And there was never really a clear explanation as to what we were praying through. But I've come to believe that it had to do with the results of those seasons of prayer. And that was the peace that we would arrive at in the end. When we pray all of our concerns, like passing through a deep, dark dark tunnel, we emerge into his peace. Praying through to the sense of peace that only comes to those who have preserved in prayer. Surrendering to the help he provides and learning to fully trust him and to settle our hearts regardless of the situation. What's waiting for us on the other side of prayer? Rest. Renewal. Listen to the words of Jesus. Come to me all you are weary and heavy burden and I will give you rest. We all run out of gas. It happens to the best of us, the experienced and the inexperienced, optimist or pessimist. It means no, means, it makes no difference. We all need to be held in his peace because we all have limited resources and strength. We all run out of gas. And so we come again to him to rest in his amazing grace. His rest renews our hearts. He refires our faith, and we can continue to stand. We will not give up. I know you prayed and nothing happened, but don't quit now. Don't take a step back. Invite the Lord's help. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean on his. Listen, when you start to speak in tongues, you're no longer praying here. You're praying from here. You're praying from here. You're saying, Lord, I'm just going to cry out to you. 
And it's going to sound crazy. And it's going to sound gobbledygook to everyone around me. But I'm not praying to everyone around me. I'm no longer looking to the person to the left or the right. And it's going to sound stupid to me. I don't even know what I'm saying. But I'm not even talking to me anymore. Lord, I'm talking to you. And when my heart gets freed up and I get released and I just cry out to him, man, when a baby starts crying, moms, start moving. Dads, get up and go to the rescue when babies cry out. And you are his children and he loves you. And when you engage fully and you allow God to use you or allow God uh, to, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you and take advantage of those resources that he's given you, it's going to change your outcome. Listen to there's a result. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Since we know that prayer is a good thing, read it like this. Let's not grow weary in praying for our loved ones. Let's not grow weary or giving up in praying for healing to come. Let us not give up believing for the miracle that is so desperately needed. Let us not give up praying for our heart's desire. I think about Hannah of the Old Testament. She stood before the Lord's tabernacle, and she was so overwrought with emotion that the high priest thought she was drunk, right? But she still cried out. And God opened her womb and gave her a son called Samuel. Why? Because there's always a, always a harvest of prayers that are sown in tears. Psalm 126 says, those who sow in, with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will return with songs of joy, carrying their sheaves with them. Hear the testimony of a young shepherd boy who became king of Judah from Psalm verse 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear to me. Will you wait for him? Will you preserve in prayer? Will you stand fast? Will you establish a habit that will cause you to automatically move into prayer as you encounter trials and temptations and the enemy of your soul? When it comes to prayer, Jesus made this command, never give it up. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking because we have a good, good father. Would you just bow your heads? Pastor will come. Just let the Lord lead you. And I know we're way past time. And I do apologize for that. But I think at least for a few of you here today, God wants to just break every chain, break every chain. And there are some of you who just need to step in to a pattern, a habit of prayer. Some of you need to just open your heart. When I stood in that gym the other day, a few weeks back, I knew I had to start. It took a while to get going. No time like the present. No time like the present. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you speak to our hearts, that your grace be established in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't get sidetracked on doctrinal issues or side notes, but we would just focus on what you're saying to us that we need to draw near to you, that we need to pour out our heart to you, and that we need to do it often and daily to the point where it just becomes an ongoing conversation. That as we walk out of this room, as we go through our life, we're having this continual conversation with you. Pray for your help in that. In Jesus' name.